Welcome everyone. We will give people a few minutes to enter in and then we will start with today's program. Okay, if my colleagues think it's uh, that people have been admitted, what do we think? Are we are we good to go? Tobias, what do you think? Yes, yeah. All right. Uh, yes. Okay, let's start it up then. All right, welcome everyone to the uh, a webinar on rebuilding macroeconomics from the margins. It's part of an ongoing SOAS economics webinar series, uh, which is called Intensifying Inequalities and the Limitations of Global Capitalism. This series is aimed at bringing together perspectives that extend our understanding of how inequalities take root in our societies and economies and how these relate to the crises of global capitalism. These include contributions on feminist economics, racial inequalities, and economic imperialism. The series is organized by the SOAS Economics Department in collaboration with the students in the Open Economics Forum, the SOAS Feminist Economics Network, and the Black Economists Network. It's being recorded, this webinar is being recorded and will be live streamed on the SOAS Economics Facebook page. Um, I would note that uh, if you have comments you'd like to make or questions you'd like to ask, and you are listening on uh, Zoom, you may put those into the chat and they'll be picked up uh, as we go. And uh, otherwise, we will, uh, if you're listening on watching on Facebook or other media, uh, you won't be able to participate in that way. Okay, so today we're, we're going to have two uh, papers that were uh, two research projects presented that have been part of a series of uh, sponsored projects in what's been called the Rebuilding Macroeconomics uh, Project. It's been sponsored by the National Institute for Economic and Social Research um, and, and headquartered there. Uh, it's been about a two and a half year project. Uh, many people who are members of the SOAS community, uh, both students and faculty, uh, have been able to participate, and I should say graduates and so on, have been able to participate um, even while the, the emphasis of this project has been on, in a sense, finding ways to rescue uh, the mainstream economics approaches to macroeconomics, uh, in part and to some extent by expanding the, uh, the, the focus to say behavioral macroeconomics or some of the social foundations or transactional dimensions of macroeconomics. Uh, there have been some projects, however, that have also what we would say would have direct links with the heterodox economics traditions. And two of those will be coming to us today. They, they're quite different and they represent two of the different kind of approaches that we see heterodox economics uh, taking. Uh, one is to build a framework. The first one would, I'll introduce in a second is building a framework that introduces uh, sort of exploratory uh, super cycles and exploratory uh, dynamics that often are chaotic or complex that go with agent-based models. It's the idea of introducing worlds in which agents are not able to be fully rational, uh, but instead must adapt to changing circumstances to kind of simulate what we think we see when we look outside in the world around us. Uh, the second kind of approach is uh, a very different kind of heterodox project, which, which basically proceeds by drilling down into some of the issues that are you know, underlie the broad macroeconomic aggregates that typically uh, dominate discussion in a very abstract way when we talk about macro policy. And in particular, you know, what we have uh, in, in this particular project is a drilling down into the nuances and, imp and sort of institutional details of infrastructure financing. Uh, what, what gives this project a heterodox turn is that there's an investigation of the way in which corporate power operating in a global scale uh, enters into this conversation and into this rather into this policy uh, cycle, uh, whilst that's really not been the intention of any of the actors involved in local governance or trying to spur local economic development. We'll start with uh, project number one that will be presented by three of our presenters. I'll keep it brief in terms of introducing. They're all very well known and esteemed colleagues. Uh, this will be Daniela Gabor, Professor of Economics and Macrofinance at the University of the West of England, Giannis de Fermos, who's a lecturer in economics at SOAS, and Joe Mitchell, who's an associate professor of economics at SOAS as well. I will turn it to the three of you. They'll take about 
25 minutes for a presentation. Please do uh, write up your questions and, and comments as they go along, because we're going to go directly into our uh, second presentation and then have an extended discussion period at the end. So take it away, Pete, folks. Uh, okay, thank you, Gary, and good afternoon, everybody. Um, I'm going to start us off, and then uh, Yanis will take over and, and Joe will finish. Uh, it kind of uh, resembles the dynamics of our, uh, <laughs> of our group in general. You'll see Yanis does all, all the hard work. Um, and uh, just to tell you a little bit about the overarching framework uh, that we've developed for this project, uh, uh, the project looks at institutional super cycles and how we can think about these um, interactions between institutions and macroeconomic processes in a more structured way that draws on the work of Hyman Minsky. Yanis, please, next. Um, so that's basically broadly our, our motivation. We come from and have contributed to various literatures that are relevant to our project, uh, starting with the international political economy, varieties of capitalism, institutional economics, and in particular, financialization. And we argue in, in uh, a series of papers, uh, two are already, well, one is out and, and you can read about it, one that uh, sets out the, the framework has been published as a working paper with the uh, Rebuilding Macro. Uh, there are a couple more that are in, in under review and a, a sort of a, one that uh, is a sort of a sideline uh, out, outcome of this process uh, that has appeared in the Canadian Journal of Development Studies. And uh, what we are doing in, in this project and in these papers is to try to put together these literatures in a, in a sort of coherent framework that uh, tries to integrate institutional change and macro and financial uh, processes. Yanis, next, please. And uh, it basically draws on Hyman Minsky's idea of institutional super cycles, which are long run cycles over you have a pretty stable um, institutional ar uh, architecture. And by institutional architecture, we mean a set of institutions and, and policies that are trying to reduce uh, uh, the endogenous instability of capitalism. And we think that this is a, a, se a separate type of um, uh, cycle literature, if you want, that draws on and contributes to the existing business cycle and, and financial cycle literature. Uh, and we argue that this, it's important because it provides a sort of broader historical overarching framework of how to think about um, the distribution of political power and the implications of the distribution of political pow power for how we organize our, uh, the institutions of uh, macroeconomic policy. Yanis, thank you. Uh, the super cycle framework very broadly from, uh, that, was, that was developed by Hyman uh, Minsky talks about uh, thwarting mechanisms and that's a, a, a difficult word to pronounce for non-English native speakers, but thwarting mechanisms as defined by Minsky are customs, institutions and policy interventions that reduce the uh, endogenous um, volatility of uh, capitalism or the amplitude of, of uh, cycles. And they contain this uh, uh, instability by putting ceilings and floors on um, economic uh, activity. And there are two types of uh, thwarting mechanisms, uh, the ones that put a floor on uh, under the level of economic activity and the ones that put a ceiling. Uh, and we have several examples of uh, how, how to think about these. Please, next, Yanis. Uh, what, what matters and what is very profoundly Minsky and about the super cycles framework uh, is the insight that whatever institutional architecture you get over a, a super cycle, it will, its effectiveness in uh, stabilizing capitalism in general uh, becomes eroded over time and it becomes eroded for two reasons. One uh, uh, very clear one has to do with private innovation in the sense that uh, private profit-seeking profit uh, institutions and agents, they learn how to adapt to the new environment because you will see as you move through super cycles, we have a, a, a specific, uh, 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 sort of set of uh, uh, steps through which the super cycle goes. As we go through the super cycles, the, ab the, the ability and effectiveness of these uh, institutions and the institutional architecture uh, uh, erodes over time because it is in the interest of profit-making institutions to try to circumvent or erode their uh, effectiveness. We also specify some long-run instability. Uh, no, it's okay. We also uh, specify some sources of lo long-run instability, 
uh, that change over time uh, and uh, because of that uh, the institutions are, are no longer able to stabilize uh, capitalism. And we, we, we provide a, a sort of um, four phases approach to the super cycles framework and argue that over time super cycles move from a, an expansion phase uh, where thwarting mechanisms like fiscal policy or monetary policy or labor market institutions and labor market arrangements or financial regulation, uh, these thwarting mechanisms are become increasingly effective as they are put in place and they safeguard stability and create or, or accommodate high economic activity. In the maturity phase, the effectiveness erodes. Um, and then uh, the fact that it, it becomes very obvious that the uh, thwarting mechanisms no longer work in, in a period of crisis. And what is more interesting in, in many ways is the period of genesis. And Yanis will tell you how, why we think that now we live in a period of genesis after the uh, erosion of the institutions of, of the uh, financial globalization uh, super cycle that we've had over the more or less uh, last 40 years. Jan, it's your turn, I think. Thank you, Daniela. So uh, let me explain a bit more how exactly we conceptualize these uh, four phases. So here we have a graph where we saw that uh, initially, as Daniela said, we have the period of expansion. And this is when actually the institutions work very well. And uh, this is when economic stability and financial stability is high. But as Daniela said, as time passes, we have these private innovations that uh, erode the institutions. We also have the interactions between uh, uh, various thwarting mechanisms that at the end of the day might lead to, to more instability. So for instance, we might have initially that uh, shadow banking uh, system can provide a source of uh, demand and that this can stabilize a bit economic activity but as time passes this creates too much debt and at some point this can erode the institutions and when this happens a, a recession can become a great recession or a depression and this is when we have the crisis and when this is the period whereby macroeconomic financial stability is is high and this is probably the most interesting period in terms of what is happening in capitalism because this is when uh, it is necessary for the system to respond to that and find new ways through which it can stabilize uh, uh, financial and economic, uh, 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 what's happening in the financial and economic system. And this is the genesis period. So after the crisis, there's a period whereby there might be a redistribution of power, there might be a, an attempt by those who currently have the power to create new institutions that will allow them to be in power but we have a lot of uh, uh, battles of ideas and the, the pace of institutional change is very high. Now, if this results in institutions and can stabilize overall how the system works, we can have a new period of expansion. But this is not necessarily the case. So a genesis period might not directly lead to a new expansionary period. It might take uh, years or even the case to have something like that. And we might have in the meantime, a lot of uh, social and economic instability. Uh, so what we have done is that we have tried to capture this by using an analysis of the institutions that we had in the previous uh, super cycles, but we also have a kind of uh, analysis about uh, specific uh, uh, variables that can capture this instability. So uh, we have created a kind of index uh, whereby we make a distinction between three different types of uh, uh, financial and macroeconomic factors. So we have what we call the, the floor variables. And the idea is that if we want to have uh, overall, if we want to have a kind of stability in capitalism, we need to have, for instance, that economic growth does not decline continuously, that unemployment rate does not increase uh, continuously, and that the financial last prices somehow stabilize. So it's necessary to avoid this in order to say that we have stability. Second, uh, we have these variables that we call ceiling variables. And we, for instance, we cannot have that card account deficits continuously increase or that the debt to GDP ratios uh, become uh, continuously higher. And finally, we have this uh, ceiling variables, which means that uh, at the end of the day, it's necessary for these variables to be within specific corridors. Otherwise, again, we can, we can have instability. So what we do is that we look at uh, past data from around the 1960s, and we use this index in order to understand when instability was high and when it was uh, low. And then we, can, we try to understand to what extent our theoretical perspective can be confirmed by the data. 
So uh, here I have the US and the UK, and uh, they have more or less uh, the same pattern. Uh, and we can see here the cyclical movements uh, since the 1960s or so. So if I use the, the US as an example, we can see that uh, the, sta the stability based on our index uh, was increasing in the expansion period, was declining in the maturity period uh, since, the since the late 1960s. During the crisis, if, uh, we, 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 had, uh, we continue to have a kind of decline. And uh, then we had the Genesis period where we had the redistribution of power uh, from the state and uh, labor unions to finance, for instance. Uh, we had the creation of new institutions that tried to support uh, global finance uh, overall, and they also created uh, a kind of environment which, uh, which was necessary in order to have what we call today uh, financialization. And once these institutions started being effective, we had the expansionary period. And this is when the index uh, becomes, uh, starts to become higher or stabilizes. Uh, but since the 1998, uh, when, for instance, we have the, co the collapse of uh, LTCM, uh, and it became clear that the shadow banking system uh, had started creating a lot of instabilities, uh, we entered uh, into the maturity period that at the end of the day led to the crisis. And uh, over the last years before the COVID-19 outbreak, uh, we, we have seen a kind of recovery but of course, we didn't see an improvement in, in, in overall instability. In, in so this means that we are currently in a period whereby we have a, a lot of different conflicts. We, have, we haven't seen some institutions that can actually create a new super cycle. And just to say that we have made this distinction between industrial capitalism and financial globalization, which more or less follows uh, what we can find in the literature. The innovation that we have is that we try to make uh, clear that we have here a cyclical pattern and we try to connect uh, what is happening uh, in the financial system, but also in, in macroeconomy overall with, uh, uh, with, with what is happening at the policy level and at the level of institutions. And we have made the classification of uh, various institutional structures and, uh, and institutional features of these two super cycles. I'm not going to, to discuss this in detail. Happy to, to have a chat about that uh, in the Q&A session. Because I would like to talk a bit about another part of our project, which is about the Genesis period. Uh, and uh, what we have right now is that uh, since the global financial crisis, we haven't seen actually a redistribution of power. So still global finance plays a very key role in the way that capitalism works, uh, which is not what we had in the 1970s or so. Uh, but what is more interesting is that uh, now it's not only difficult to have a new super cycle because we haven't seen uh, so far institutions that can stabilize the system, but we also have another big challenge, which is the climate crisis. And any kind of institution that is going to be created and, and, have, uh, and has this role that we described before uh, to, uh, in terms of creating fl floors and ceilings, it's necessary for this to address the climate crisis. And of course, global finance has realized that. And this is why over the last uh, maybe two or three years primarily, we have seen that uh, the global financial institutions uh, have a lot of interest in what is happening right now with climate change. And they have tried to provide a kind of solution and we, when we are trying to, to explain exactly what is uh, the overall suggestion here. And uh, based on uh, uh, the work that Daniela has done, uh, uh, we call this the Wall Street Consensus. Uh, and we uh, focus here primarily on the climate perspectives of this Wall Street Consensus. So uh, we have seen that global financial institutions now try to say that they can actually support the transition to a low carbon economy. Uh, we, we have seen a lot of policies that try to, prom to promote climate projects in the global south through PPPs. Uh, we have this uh, explosion of the interest in uh, uh, environmental, uh, social and governance indicators, the ESG, that are supposed to be the way through which we can understand whether so uh, something is green or not. And uh, all this has created a kind of uh, institutional structure that uh, uh, at the end of the day, what global finance wants to do with it is to, to argue that this can create a, a, a kind of a green recovery that at the end of the day can lead us to a new super cycle. And what is very interesting to note here is that uh, if we look, if we understand exactly what is the proposal from global finance at this stage, 
you can see that uh, global finance wants governments to have a role in, in that process and they want central banks to have a role but their role is primarily to protect uh, the system when there is a problem so what can happen through these institutions and, and through these new ideas is that at the end of the day central banks we, we might need to be what has been called uh, climate rescuers of last resort. So if we have some climate related events that are going to create instability and are going to affect the profitability of uh, uh, financial investors, then central banks uh, might need to intervene uh, in order to, to save the system. And governments have also to play a role, not only in terms of finance, but also in terms of supporting the economy and people who might be affected by climate change. So, uh, they do not play the role uh, that uh, an, an active role in designing the transition to a low carbon economy, but they have a significant role to play in terms of saving uh, the, the system. And uh, I have to say that uh, there is also a very important role for some uh, climate policies like carbon pricing, which is the most the more standard policy that has been promoted over the last years in the area of climate change. And what is crucial is that. Uh, this is a policy that is now is being promoting in the global south and if we combine this with what is happening right now with COVID-19 it seems that it is very likely that carbon pricing will be used not only as a tool that in theory can address climate change but also as a way through which public debt can be reduced in these countries because we know that it's very likely that the austerity argument will become again very popular uh, since now public debt has increased the, in many uh, uh, poor countries. So uh, this is uh, the, the story behind the Wall Street consensus is that it's not necessary to redistribute power. Global finance has a solution to our climate problems. And these are the institutions that can actually lead us to the green recovery. On the other hand, uh, we have this set of proposals around the, the what is often called the Green New Deal. And first of all, I have to say that there is not necessarily consistency across all the proposals about the Green New Deal. We're trying to, to understand exactly the, the, the general framework within which these proposals have been uh, made, but uh, there are differences between uh, different types of uh, suggestions. So what we have done here is to, to try to classify, uh, again, the, the different types of policies and institutions that have been promoted through the Green New Deal proposals. And uh, the first thing that I would like to point out is that uh, uh, all the Green, Green New Deal proposals try to emphasize the, the role of the state in organizing the transition to a low carbon economy. Uh, distribution, uh, at least within countries, is at the core of many of the proposals. So we have proposals about the welfare state. We have proposals that support the idea that we need to have more progressive taxation. Uh, and uh, we also have recently uh, more proposals within the Green New Deal about the need to uh, penalize uh, what is called dirty finance. Uh, because we know that the financial system has supported a lot of polluting activities, and the idea is that we need to have penalties about that. And in that sense, the Green New Deal has uh, at least has an intention to reduce the power of global finance. Now, there are two uh, uh, big questions about uh, how the proposals about the Green New Deal will involve. One issue is whether the Green New Deal will take seriously issues of climate change. Uh, we have a lot of discussions about debt reliefs, uh, climate reparations. It's not very clear that the Green New Deal proposals uh, will or ha have incorporated that or whether they will incorporate this perspective. And there's also a very important debate about the role of the growth and whether uh, we can actually have the same consumption patterns as we had in the past if we need to address the climate crisis. And of course, the answer is that we, we, we have to think about that very carefully because this is very important. But the, the, main, the main idea here is that we can have a super cycle by changing the, redistrib the, the, the distribution of power. So this is a key difference compared to the Wall Street consensus. So we're tr we, we are trying to use our framework to understand what is happening. And the only final thing that I would like to say is that uh, if we think about the climate crisis, the Wall Street consensus tries to, to say that this can be addressed through climate finance. But in reality, these proposals that have been made are very far from making us in line with a two degree scenario. And the Green New Deal uh, is more ambitious. It has a higher potential in theory, but the, the two degree scenario is still not easy to be achieved, even if we have all these changes that you can see on the slide. So it's not clear that we can have a green super cycle. 
But what we were saying is that this battle of ideas at the end of the day will lead to some new institutions and we are trying to understand uh, this process. So I will hand over to, to Joe, who is going to, to talk about another part of, of, of our project. So I will stop sharing the slides. I wonder if I should check in with the chair on time to see if I have time to come in. You, yeah, you're, you're at uh, four minutes from the 25. Uh, so I would say uh, definitely make some comments for sure. And then we'll move to our second paper. Thank you. Okay, uh, hopefully you see uh, the slides I'm sharing. I will try and use my four minutes uh, as efficiently as I can. So I'll just make some uh, introductory or summary comments on uh, another paper, which is part of the project, where we try and do something uh, different, again, to the first two papers, which is that we apply our, our framework and we identify some key features that we think are likely to apply in any forthcoming super cycle, whether it's the, the Green New Deal or the uh, Wall Street super cycle. And we, we take a closer look at certain aspects of um, the financial global, the global financial system, uh, which we think will be one way or another part of both of these two um, scenarios or any other plausible scenario. And in particular, what we do in this paper is we look at the role of the global dollar footprint. We are of the view that this is not something which is likely to change in the near future. So any forthcoming super cycle is likely to have to contend with the fact that the dollar remains the, um, the money of the global system and uneven and unequal access to dollar liquidity will be an ongoing source of potential financial instability and vulnerability, and therefore requires uh, attention and potential policy um, action. We, in the paper, I'm gonna very quickly summarize what we do. We present some history of the use of foreign exchange swaps, and we show that uh, in the early days of the post-war period, these were used fairly, extensive, uh, fairly extensively by official institutions, and this waned in the post-1973, post-Bretton Woods period, replaced by uh, the rise of private usage of FX swaps. Of course, since 2008, we've seen the return of official FX swaps as a mechanism for getting dollar liquidity to countries that need it um, in short notice at short notice. We present some empirical um, evidence drawn from the Bank for International Settlements of the geography of the dollar footprint, and in particular, the geography of the global foreign exchange swap market. And as I will show briefly, these two are substantially um, interconnected. The, the dollar FX, the FX swap geography is to a substantial extent and increasingly so, uh, a geography of the dollar. What we've seen is over the last three or four decades, with the exception of the euro as an international global funding currency, the dollar has become ever more dominant. There was a period which ended sometime around the global financial crisis in which the euro looked as if it, uh, at least in some uh, areas, might become a contender for a global currency. But since then, particularly in what we call the shadow banking system, uh, in the claims between banks and non-banks and non-bank financial institutions, the use of the dollar has increased substantially. Associated with this is a debate about the extent to which cross-border financial vulnerability is driven by hidden leverage in the form of FX swaps. To what extent are FX swaps providing cross-border, to a large extent, dollar lending, which is hidden from official statistics and therefore is a source of financial vulnerability at the global scale? Evidence in favor of this view that's um, often presented is the gap between global dollar assets and global 
dollar liabilities. And if we break this down into geographical regions between those countries um, at the in the top row, which are long dollars globally, and those which are short at the bottom, there is a small number of countries that account for a large proportion of the cross-border positions. Um, and Japan stands out as the single largest um, short dollar country, the country which has um, large dollar liabilities relative to assets. And what is often argued is that at the aggregate global level, the gap between um, dollar assets and dollar liabilities is covered by using FX swaps and is therefore a measure of global FX swap usage. And it has been rising, um, as we can see here, uh, almost steadily, well, fairly steadily, since at least 2000. What we argue is, I'm going to skip over some of these empirical exhibits because I need to actually conclude. I understand that I must have used my four minutes already. What we argue is that the claim that FX swaps are hidden leverage is incorrect. And in the paper, there's a detailed balance sheet based example where we explain our argument there. I don't have time to go into that in detail now. What we argue is although FX swaps do not uh, fulfill the criteria we identified to, to count as debt contracts. Although they have strong similarities to repo contracts, which are short-term debt contracts arranged as uh, a swap and a subsequent reversal of instruments, we argue that it's incorrect to use this similarity to argue that FX swaps are in fact a form of hidden debt. However, we argue that FX swaps often occur alongside increases in cross-border lending activity. So we argue that they are effectively used as a hedging instrument to hedge against exchange rate movements and foreign exchange risk, but they are nonetheless an indicator of rising cross-border dollar positions. And we give some case studies for uh, the types of situations in which those positions occur and these dollar funding gaps. And these are highly uh, heterogeneous. Um, for example, dollars supplied by sovereign wealth funds with excess dollar liquidity to Japanese investors who wish to take out positions against dollar denominated assets will have particular cyclical dynamics. And this will be very different to the situation where, for example, emerging market economies are issuing dollar denominated debts to cover uh, primary needs such as uh, energy and so on. But underlying all of this is the fact that the dollar liquidity is inherently pro-cyclical and therefore policy interventions will be required um, over and above, ideally, the ad hoc arrangements and the hierarchical arrangements that we've seen of the last super cycle by which uh, official swap lines were reintroduced, in some cases extended to new countries, but many countries uh, further down the hierarchy are left effectively uh, engaging in private operations to engage to, to obtain the dollar liquidity that they need. Okay, I have overstepped my four minutes, I conclude um, with the thought that continued uneven hierarchical Fed dollar provision of the type we've seen is unlikely to be effective as a thwarting mechanism in our super cycles framework. And then as part of a green super cycle, a new green new deal super cycle, we would hope to see um, a more uh, well thought out system of global dollar liquidity provision. I conclude there. Thank you very much, Joe. And let's uh, uh, just appreciate as an audience that what we have in this project are some of the elements that must be put together if we're to think comprehensively about the, the choices facing us right now. We've got the question of the macro cycles and how they've been transformed, how they deviate from what might be needed to have a controllable capitalism. Uh, we see as well the, the, the need to link this to the problem of sustainability. And of course, the Green New Deal versus the degrowth uh, debate is in there. And all of this distorted and run through the lens of financial 
uh, both uh, hedging and speculation that accompanies these processes. It's a huge uh, meal to, to eat. And uh, I, we can see that our, our authors in this first paper have been very adventurous in throwing out a whole series of ideas. And I would urge everybody to check out those, those papers. We'll now turn to our second project. Uh, this is a project that basically instead will focus called, is called Trajectories and in Infra Infrastructure Financing in the UK. And whilst it does uh, deal with uh, the UK infrastructure, it puts it through an interdisciplinary lens, bringing in anthropology perspectives and uh, political economy perspectives and kind of identifying blind spots in what macroeconomic policy normally often misses. And in particular, the linkage of uh, these processes of infrastructure financing to uh, often poorly regulated or even rogue uh, private investors and financiers. Uh, the project would be brought to us today and summarized by uh, Elisa van Weyenberg, uh, who's a senior lecturer in economics and co-head of the economics department at SOAS, Kate Bayliss, who's a senior research fellow at so SOAS, and Benjamin Bowles, who's lecturer in social anthropology at SOAS as well. So welcome all, and you have 25 minutes. Thank you uh, very much, uh, Gary. So I'm Elisa and I'm very uh, honored to be here together with Kate and Ben to talk a little bit about this other project that was uh, funded by the Rebuilding Magnet Network uh, that is focused specifically, as Gary says, on, on trying to understand trajectories of infrastructure financing uh, in the UK. So the original purpose uh, of our project was to examine newly emerging forms, or if you want, instrumentalities of uh, private finance in uh, UK infrastructure. Uh, our project ran between May 2019 and, and uh, October 2020. And in essence, we were interested uh, in examining mutations in the way in which infrastructure is financialized in the UK, taking as the starting point of our investigation, the abolition by uh, the British government of the use of what was called the Private Finance Initiative, PFI, or in its later iteration, PF2, in autumn 2018. So tensions had emerged in the British model of involving private finance in infrastructure. And this was most emblematic in, its, in the abandonment by the government of the private finance initiative in autumn 2018. And our question then was, okay, what is to come next in terms of how private finance is going to be involved uh, in infrastructure? Now the private finance initiative, PFI or PF2 had played a very important role to draw in private finance into new infrastructure assets, in particular in the health, education, defense, and transport uh, sectors. Now, this was an important question, what was co to come next, not just for the UK, but also more broadly, given the heavy promotion of private finance, something that uh, Daniela, Yanis, and Joe have already referred to in their project, the heavy promotion of private finance in infrastructure globally first with the SDGs and now uh, since the pandemic with the agenda around uh, building uh, back better. Now in the context of the rebuilding macro uh, funding scheme, so we're supposed to make contributions in terms of how we can rethink uh, what macroeconomics should do, etc. We were seeking to use our substantive interest in these mutations around the particular ways in which private finance is mobilized in infrastructure to be able to draw attention to the way in which underlying economic, financial, political, as well as cultural realities affect infrastructure financing policies and practices. So for us, the infra infrastructure financing policy was to serve as an index for an understanding of the role of the state beyond the prism that was tradition that's traditionally offered uh, by uh, macroeconomics. What that meant more concretely is that we see infrastructure as a means by which political and uh, social relations are articulated, that contrary to traditional macroeconomic understandings, we see infrastructure and its financing not as politically neutral or simply technocratic. Importantly, infrastructure uh, policy and practices for us are not just a matter of how much, which is infrastructure's quantitative dimension as an additional source of demand, creating employment and output, but also of what, which is infrastructure's link to productivity and growth, but crucially of how, and that captures then the processes of financing and delivering infrastructure that, has, that will have particular uh, implications. So in this way, 
examining the role of private finance in infrastructure allows to reveal a blind spot of macroeconomics in its failure to situate financialization as core to contemporary state economy relations. Now, our research unfolded in the most tumultuous political and economic circumstances that the UK has witnessed in decades. Yeah, in one year, the year of our research project, we had multiple votes of no confidence in a sitting government, stalling Brexit negotiations, change of prime minister, election Brexit, three chancellors, a pandemic, onset of a recession, and the deployment of monetary and, and, and fiscal tools on scales not seen in peacetime. And as we concluded our project in October 2020, there was actually very little clarity in terms of how the government would move forward concretely. I think you can hear some shouting in the background, but that's fine. So there was very little clarity in terms of how the government would move forward concretely in terms of replacing the private finance initiative that it had uh, abolished. Now, is then suddenly in late 2020, in late November 2020, up till uh, mid-December, we had this flurry of government policy documents around infrastructure. So we had the uh, National Infrastructure Strategy that was published late November 2020, and that was more than a year overdue. We had a response to the consultation on how to finance new nuclear power stations, to which the government remains committed. There was an energy white paper, and there was an interim report by the Treasury on how to finance the transition to uh, net zero. Now, these the various policy documents are big on general statements, but they're very weak uh, on detail. However, while it does not seem to be the case that new mechanisms of drawing in private finance in infrastructure are about to emerge in the UK, the existing mechanisms that have regulation at their heart are likely to be upscaled. So regulation will remain very much, economic regulation as it's called, will remain very much at the heart of the infrastructure financing landscape going forward. And across these various policy documents that have now emerged, we have this recurring emphasis on affordability, or quote unquote, on fairness, quote unquote, as important principles to govern decisions around financing and funding uh, of infrastructure. Now that raises a whole set of issues that Kate will engage with uh, in more detail around the question of regulation. To what purpose do we have economic regulation and to whose uh, benefit? So I'm going to hand over to Ben Bowles, our social anthropologist in the project, who is first going to say a few things about around our approach and methods. And then Kate is going to take this forward in uh, is to talk about some of the results, if you want, of what we discovered by looking in more detail um, to what we, we see as the fundamental inadequacies or impossibilities of a regulatory framework as it exists within which financial, financialized infrastructure takes shape. And she's going to do that by focusing on one very important, powerful agent that is uh, operating within the British infrastructure uh, financing landscape. So over to you, Ben. Thank you very much, Elisa. I am going to talk about our approach and method, uh, specifically how we engage with interdisciplinarity on the project. Can everybody hear me okay? Is that all right? Fantastic. Yeah. Okay, um, so first of all, the limitations of macroeconomic understandings of infrastructure have been increasingly illustrated, uh, illustrated by other disciplines. This includes anthropology, my home disciplines, approach to infrastructures as assemblages. That means as coming together, uh, coming together of people, relationships, technologies, financial flows, and ideas. Um, so this, uh, so this implies an interdisciplinarity. Um, where we in turn chose to adopt a frame from political economy, uh, the systems of provision approach or SOP approach that I'm going to go into some more detail, detail in, in a minute. Uh, specifically, this led to, uh, to us focusing on the structures, agents and processes of public provision to unpack the ideas pertinent to infrastructure financing and the cultures and norms that they give rise to. So under infrastructure finance, who gets what, under what conditions, and with what effect. This is agent-led and based on relationships rather than a set of technocratic decisions. Um, fundamentally and importantly, I think, uh, this research was inductive. So it was an open rather than hypothesis-driven inquiry into the ways in which infrastructure financing in the UK is changing and why. And the inductive approach was actually why we ended up going more towards looking at regulation than some of the things that we originally thought that we would be focusing on uh, because of the importance of this regulated asset base. 
And the last thing to say in general about this approach is that we had a specific interest in institutional will, real world processes, narratives and developments um, that affect uh, macroeconomic outcomes and reflect broader economic strategies. So these larger and general trends are reflected in practice and that's what we really wanted to get at. So why did we choose the SOP? or a systems of provision approach. Well, um, this is a political economy approach, uh, approach that um, we identified as the best way of examining a complex system, like, for example, the provision of water or, um, the, or power infrastructure. The SOP approach uh, was devised in the 1990s by Ben Fine in response to the failing of consumption studies to adequately explain what leads to particular outcomes in terms of who has what, how, and why. It draws on political economy, as well as insights from other disciplines, including anthropology, sociology, and psychology, and takes the view that consumption can be only be explained by a, con a contextually specific and systematic approach. Outcomes in SOP are considered to be vertically linked to provisioning systems. Further, it is not just the way in which goods and services are provided that shape outcomes, but the ways in which the end user engages with these. Such cultures of consumption tend to be clustered rather than individual, giving rise to social norms of consumption, which are indicative of the propensity of certain groups different, uh, differentially to own or have access to certain types of goods or services. So uh, Ben Fine developed the SOP approach on the grounds that it is only by careful analysis of the contested relations between agents along this chain of provisioning, with attention to the features of the commodity and the context, as well as associated cultures, that we can understand the factors that lead to specific consumption outcomes. In contrast to other approaches to consumption, which assume a kind of, kind of universality for, uh, for the SOP approach, understandings of consumption are rooted in the specifics of what is being consumed, where and when. So the diagram in front of you, the complicated drivers of consumption outlined above have been synthesized into five broad thematic elements. These themes, they're interrelated and the boundaries between them may be blurred. These are agents, structures, processes, relations and material cultures. And they are, as I say, interrelated and all have effect in the outcome of consumption. It was these sets of, this set of active components that we sent out to identify in the financing of UK infrastructure. So that's the SOP approach and why we used it. I want to talk a little bit uh, more about our particular interdisciplinary approach and the way in which uh, political economy and anthropology in, uh, in particular answer different parts of this infrastructure financing question. We contend that the study of infrastructure finance benefits from a interdisciplinary engagement. Concepts drawn from economics and political economy can help us to understand not just how meaning emerges and is it attributed to particular economic and infrastructural interventions, but also how specific infrastructural interventions change relationships between individuals, communities, collectivities, states, corporations, and other private agents with attendant redistributions of power and resources. Anthropology in turn adds depth to political economy to unpack the narratives and meanings associated with infrastructure and how these may differ between actors, be they actors in finance, construction companies, the state, end users or taxpayers. And similarly, in, again, economics or political economy provides anthropology with an attention to financial and fiscal flows, sometimes something that anthropologists can often uh, be slightly worse and not quite have the tools at getting at so that the anthropology can gain an appreciation of the distributional impacts and wider issues that result from infrastructure provision, such as on labour effects and the effects on regional development. Uh, this, we say, will result in a richer understanding of what infrastructure is, what the effects are, and who are the winners and losers in an, infold, in an enfolding set of relationships. So this is a quote that I particularly like that, uh, that demonstrates what uh, the way that we think about interdisciplinarity is from Bath. Uh, it is that interdisciplinary work, so much discussed these days, is not about confronting already constituted disciplines. To do something interdisciplinary, it's not enough to just choose a subject, a theme, and gather around it two or three sciences. Interdisciplinarity consists in creating a new object that belongs to, uh, to no one. So to, to conclude my section and pass on to Kate,
we uh, took this seriously and did not seek to just take infrastructure as an object and approach it separately as an anthropologist and political economist, and then to add our accounts together in a kind of this and that fashion. Rather, we uh, set out to look at the infrastructure system as one of Bath's new objects and observe using all of the tools at our disposal and also sharing our methods. So we conducted the interviews together, we uh, went into the data, uh, data together, uh, together and the uh, archive and literature uh, to understand sharing our methods, how different parts of it fit together to make a whole. So uh, Kate is going to now tell us how using these methods, what we went on to find. Thank you. Thanks, thanks everyone. Can you all hear me? Is it okay? Yeah, great. Okay, uh, so in a very short space of time, I'm going to talk about uh, what we found, our, go to our findings. Um, so uh, we decided to focus on infrastructure financialization and the role of regulation in this because um, this emerged as important in our, in our meetings. This is our inductive approach. So there's a growing literature on infrastructure financialization and generally it's associated with uh, innovations uh, in methods by which investors generate returns through financial engineering. Things like securitization of future income streams, a high debt, um, and uh, often very complicated cor uh, corporate structures. So we have funds flowing between different companies within the same, uh, same corporate family in the forms of loans and charges and interest payments and dividends in ways that are very difficult to follow and even more difficult to follow where some of the companies may be located in tax havens. Uh, so clearly then this uh, system, these systems are associated with a significant social cost. We're seeing regressive transfers from taxpayers and service users that many of may struggle to pay uh, to shareholders. We're seeing weakened accountability and transparency with these complex structures and um, potentially risky, highly indebted financial structures. And there's also the risk of maybe these becoming too big to fail, which then compromises regulation. So in the UK, uh, as elsewhere, we're seeing the government's committed to, as we heard earlier as well from the first presentation, to a substantial share of private financing infrastructure. So Elise has mentioned our PVP model, the PFI. Uh, other models include contracts for difference in, um, in renewables. And then we have the regulated asset base, which um, I'm going to talk about in a bit more detail. But essentially, these are different mechanisms for ensuring that investors receive a secure revenue stream. This is really important if you're going to have private finance because they're going, if they're going to commit funds up front, they need to be sure they're going to get their money back. So these are sort of different modifications of incentivization for companies. So we're going to talk about the, um, the RAD model in water and energy in Britain and show how this is facilitated financialization. Uh, I just want to mention in energy, we're talking about transmission and distribution networks and not the retail companies that deal with consumers. So um, the next slide, thank you. Um, so regulation in water and energy takes the form of a system of price controls. It's known as RPI minus X, uh, an independent regulator for the different sectors off what for water, off gem for energy. So the essence of the system is that the maximum tariffs that can be charged are set in advance every five years following a price review. And the allowed price increase is the inflation level and a factor X, which is based on the regulated asset base, race based on anticipated costs and performance against targets. So in water in 2019, PR19 was the price review, which set prices for 2020 to 2025. So an important part of the whole regulatory uh, structure is that it's based on a narrative of competition. So these are seen as imperfect markets and interventions are all about replicating competitive processes. So even the price control system is intended to mimic a system where the producer would effectively be a price taker uh, in, in situation of competition. And importantly, because of this understanding, this kind of narrative, uh, the regulator doesn't intervene in company debts or dividend payouts or corporate structures. These are seen as market outcomes. So prices are set in advance and outcomes are based on assumptions. And these um, have consistently been biased being biased in favor of companies. And this is uh, widely acknowledged 
Uh, infrastructure financialization has been going on in water since financial investors got involved in the mid 2000s. And a number of companies, although not all, but the companies owned by financial investors in the sort of classic pattern of financialization, they've hiked up debts, paid out high dividends, working through offshore, uh, some offshore corporations in some cases. And this seemed to be ignored by the regulator for a long time, but in 2019, we saw some new measures introduced specifically around financialization. Uh, one measure was that companies were required to share any benefits from being highly indebted with their customers. So this is clearly targeted at financialization. And then the PR19 price review were required a reduction in water bills by an average of 12% over the next five years. So this is seen as the regulator being very tough on, on water companies, the toughest it's ever been. Um, but unfortunately, since then we've had quite a backlash. We've had an outcry from companies and four companies have taken an appeal to the Competition and Markets Authority. And this is unprecedented um, to see that so many companies do this. And also we've seen a downgrading of the company's uh, credit ratings um, because uh, on the grounds of what the Moody's, the credit ratings agency calls political interference because these measures are seen as departures from long-standing regulatory practice. So, uh, so far the CMA seems to be siding with companies, um, but they make their final decision in March. Uh, so we're waiting to hear. But this dispute, I think, gets to the heart of the tensions of regulating infrastructure finance. On the one hand, the CMA is concerned that tighter controls will be a deterrent to investors, but then Ofwat has a greater interest in protecting consumers. But our view was that even if these, adjust these adjustments proposed by Ofwat could be implemented, we still had a sense that even these measures weren't really fully engaging with the ways in which shareholders are maximizing their returns in practice, particularly when it comes to financialization. And this is part of the insights from using this uh, SOP approach. If you look at a sort of more systemic um, framework and the, the agents involved. So we looked in more detail at the activities of um, one, uh, one investor that operates across water and energy, uh, Macquarie. So Macquarie is a, uh, an Australian bank, one of the world's largest infrastructure investors and um, operates a range of funds um, across the globe. Uh, but essentially they hold and invest funds for smaller investors and for, um, for pension funds and individuals. And they earn their fees from what they charge to investors. It's very successful, it's highly praised, and wins awards and their funds are usually oversubscribed. And it operates across a range of sectors in the UK. In particular, we were interested in its involvement in um, water and gas networks. So um, in water, um, we, sorry, I've just lost my notes a second there. Um, so in water, uh, Macquarie first got involved with a small company in 2003, but then they sold this stake in 2006. But during this time, they raised debt finance via subsidiary in the Cayman Islands and doubled the borrowing of this utility. But then in 2006, they led a consortium that bought Thames Water, which is England's biggest water utility. So the Macquarie stake, uh, they had a 48% stake in the company that bought Thames in 2006. And this was held by six separate funds and some were located in Bermuda and Jersey. So it's a very complex ownership structure. Uh, and so Macquarie had its stake for 10 years. It sold its final stake in 2017. And in that time, the financing of Thames Water was, was revolutionized. So, so this chart shows the level of gearing, so the ratio of debt to equity uh, of, of Thames Water. And this is a kind of measure of the company's indebtedness. So we have the, the notional gearing level, uh, which is in green, which is what of what kind of assumes companies will be like in terms of gearing. Then we have the industry average, and then we see uh, the dark blue line is Thames is gearing. So when Thames took over in 2007, gearing shot up, uh, went from 57% to 72%. So at the time of the refinancing, the company paid itself dividends, um, substantial dividends around the time of the refinancing, it went from, they paid 500, over 500 million 
despite having profits of only 190 million. But also this company refinancing meant that part of the debt borrowed by investors was then allocated to the utility, this kind of acquisition debt. So it's another element of the increasing debt of the utility of terms. Um, so at the same time as increasing debts, they were also paying themselves dividends. And at the same time that debts and dividends are increasing, Thames is also pouring raw sewage into the water and um, into the river, sorry. And in 2017, Thames received one of the largest fines for pollution caused by negligence. So this isn't a great track record, and this has been documented and led to lots of negative press when Macquarie sold its final stake in Thames. Here are some of the headlines, uh, the murky structure of a utility company. So, um, so it's well established that Thames under Macquarie, uh, under Macquarie ownership, it hasn't really been beneficial for, for, the, for the water utility, but then what's interesting is what happened next. So in the year that it sold its final stake in Thames, Macquarie was part of a consortium, consortium, consortium that bought um, Caden, which is the country's largest gas network. They bought it from National Grid. So it supplies gas to half of England. Now, uh, in the four years since taking over Caden, the new owners have set up a parent company um, in Jersey. They paid dividends of 1.2 billion over the first four years. Now, Caden isn't highly geared in the way that Thames was. They haven't had that kind of massive escalation in gearing, uh, but this is in part due to restrictions attached to borrowing. But they have had their credit rating downgraded um, on account of the debts of the immediate holding parent company. So it looks like there's upward pressure on borrowing within the corporate structure. So it seems that some of the financialization that's taken place um, in waters being replicated in gas. And uh, so while there's lots of criticism of the way Macquarie operated in terms, there's nothing to stop them in the regulatory process to stop them moving straight onto the biggest gas distributor. So financialized entities are generating a large share of their returns in ways that are outside regulatory jurisdiction. So they set up companies offshore, they refinance, they have loans with shareholders, they sell property, they make capital gains. Um, but we can't quantify this because the information's not in the public domain. But we can learn from the decisions of investors in, in Macquarie's investment funds. So I came across this, this chart, it's called a value bridge chart from a presentation to the South Carolina Retirement System Investment Commission in June, advising this pension fund to invest in um, um, the Macquarie Supercore Infrastructure Fund. Uh, on the basis of the high returns generated by an earlier Macquarie fund that had invested in Thames Water. So I was able to access the workings of the chart, but it shows that the initial equity, which was about 2.8 billion, was increased by 2.7 times as a result of their investment in Thames Water. Um, and it also mentions in the presentation that this is outside of the allowable return. So from this chart, it seems that like nearly five billion pounds is reaching shareholders in ways that are outside the control of the, of the regulator. So conclusions. Um, so we found that the governance framework for infrastructure in water um, and energy misses out a vast stretch of value capture by investors. And this narrative of markets and competition has actually been very powerful in obscuring the realities of financial extraction and the inequalities generated by this financialized firms are allowed to generate substantial returns in ways uh, that are outside the scope of regulation. Now the state is an agent of this. The state facilitates financialization. It sets the rules and the legal framing of what returns could be secured and how. Uh, can the gaps be plugged? It's tempting to think more regulation can sort this out. But regulation raises, raises uh, numerous challenges aside from financialization. I am um, just even just for things like information asymmetry, let alone mediating contested interests. And there are limits to what you can do with regulation. The process has become increasingly cumbersome. So this is a supposedly market led process, but it's now become increasingly heavy with state intervention. The process is taking longer. We're starting the next price review, PR24, that's already started, and we still haven't finished PR19. So this hasn't happened before. So aside from the costs, we're losing transparency in the density of regulatory outputs 
So it's kind of sinking under its own weight, the regulatory structure. And also the regulators inevitably behind the investors, a step behind is responding to financial innovation, by which time the investors have moved on. The measures being introduced by Offport now, to some extent, a result from what Macquarie did, but Macquarie's now out of the water. So uh, they can be penalizing the wrong people. So it's hard to imagine how regulation can really combat this financialized extraction um, in a way that's really genuinely socially equitable. I mean, moving forward, we have governments and international agencies like the World Bank calling for more private investment, uh, particularly in, um, in the wake of COVID as well. But then infrastructure is ultimately funded by end users and taxpayers. Uh, we need not to forget that. So it's widely stated that we need fair regulation, um, but it's not easily, um, it's, you don't often see exactly what that means in practice. And it's difficult to see how this can really work if we're having in context in the, of financialization. So if we're gonna look at social equity as an objective to upscale fi private finance, we need to look very carefully at this to avoid creating a more regressive structures. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kate. <laughs> we we have uh, the scenario then that, as uh, as in the other paper, is extremely complex. Uh, Cross-cutting regulations protecting different interests, and yet at the same time exposing uh, different players to extreme amounts of risk, and leveraging up costs all the way through without necessarily delivering the goods promised. How to move from here? Let's go into, into the question and answer session and exactly um, uh, before we, we, we go farther. And uh, what I'd like to do is to pull two questions that have come uh, in, immediately for the first presentation. Maybe we'll take those, I'll, I'll uh, ask both of those and um, then we'll allow the, the, the members of that group to respond and that will give us time to reflect a little bit more on the second presentation and perhaps to have a second round of questions on that second presentation. Okay, so the first two qu sets of questions. Uh, first from Sarah, how have, have you explored how institutional super cycles apply to contexts beyond the US and the UK? What's the role of forms of governance that differ by nation even in the context of globalization. So asking that question. And then we have a, a second question from Abrar. And Abrar asks, uh, what international institutional mechanism would you suggest for the climate, the global climate issues given the crisis after the Kyoto Protocol? So those are two questions put on the table uh, for our first group of presenters. So I'll leave you to decide who, who might like to give some response. Maybe shall I start and sure. Daniela Zo could probably uh, add their thoughts to this. Uh, okay, I mean, uh, great question by Sarah. Uh, we have focused uh, for this project on the UK, the US uh, and a few other countries in the global north like Italy, Canada, uh, Germany, Japan. Uh, so in terms of uh, 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 what is happening in, in other countries around the world, let me first say that uh, in theory, it's, uh, it's more difficult to identify super cycles, for instance, in the global south, because in many cases, the institutional structures that we can find there do not uh, work for a long period, and it's difficult to pr produce the same, the same pattern. But we haven't looked into that, and it would be interesting to, to look into, into this, of course. Uh, what is our interest in particular is how the super cycles in the global north have impacts on what is happening in the global south. So, for example, if we think about the current genesis period, uh, one way through which the, the global financial system has responded to the crisis is by having, for instance, uh, these quantitative easy programs. And there have been a lot of impacts of the quantitative easy programs on what is happening in emerging market economies. And in many cases, this also, this also happens through the, the FX swaps that uh, uh, Joe described quickly. Uh, we are also interested in uh, the fact that the crisis that we have uh, in, in, the, in, in the super cycles in the global north uh, have implications for the global south in what sense? In the sense that the returns, for instance, for institutional investors have gone down 
And as a result of that, there has been an interest in designing policies in the global uh, uh, south, for instance, through uh, PPPs. And we have seen that there has been a, a high interest from that, especially since to, to 2015, during what we call the Genesis period. So uh, our, our emphasis is on understanding these effects of what is happening in the, in the super cycles in the global north uh, on, uh, and how this affects the, the global south. Uh, but it would be very interesting, of course, to understand uh, also how this can work in, in, uh, uh, in poor countries. Uh, now, the, in terms of the other question, I mean, it's very difficult now to, to discuss mm. the details of, a, of an international institutional mechanism. But what I would like to point out is that and there's, and there is also an issue of feasibility. I mean, what is feasible and what we would like to have. Uh, but I think what is crucial is that over the last two or three years, there has been more emphasis on issues of climate uh, justice. And uh, there is also the issue that uh, at the end of the day, uh, countries that have contributed very little to the problem are asked to uh, conduct now investments in order to contribute to climate mitigation. Uh, and these countries also have to spend a lot in order to adapt to, to the reality of climate. Uh, so I think what is very crucial about how to address, address the climate crisis is uh, how exactly countries uh, that don't, don't have the responsibility for the climate crisis can uh, address the financing issue. And the answer should not be through the Wall Street consensus. It's through, it's, it should be through mechanisms that uh, real, uh, acknowledge the problem of climate justice. So we have the suggestions about climate reparations. We have the suggestions about debt reliefs. This would be at the core of, of, uh, of all these uh, debates with respect to how we can address globally the problem of climate change. And hopefully this uh, gradually will become uh, part of these discussions. I mean, I, I, I don't think we have more time to talk about other details of this, but I, I think this is a very interesting uh, question. Yeah, this, and actually this, uh, thank you for that, Giannis. I'll tell you what, why don't we bring in the, uh, the first question for the second paper, because it goes to this question of who bears risk and how that works out. Um, and um, maybe we can uh, hear an answer to that and then come back to the, the first group. The question that was asked by Farwa is uh, about uh, Macquarie Fund's infrastructure assets across the world uh, have a tendency to invest in monopolies. So benefiting from limited competition and barriers to entry, as well as deepening them. And this, you know, this, did, do you, did you come across these patterns in the context of Afwat in the UK. And I would add to that uh, the idea that actually what we see in the, in, in the global scale is the idea that uh, we, should we can have blended finance that will de-risk uh, the, the private sector as it contributes to uh, the, you know, the financing of let's say climate change. And actually it strikes me that the extreme financialization that we're seeing that you recorded in your project perhaps has to do with the fact that uh, basically the de-risking of all the financial players all the way along through uh, ends up adding to these ex extreme levels of debt that end up getting handed to the UK uh, users and taxpayers. So let me ask our second team, what do you think about this question of Macquarie funds and their tendency to invest in monopoly uh, projects and so on? Uh, shall I go ahead? Say yep. something? Yeah. Jump in. Yeah. Uh, yeah, totally. Macquarie invests in uh, in secure investments uh, in in uh, in monopolies um, uh, in the UK, and they've they've been very strategic in where they put put their investments. I mean, in so in roads, uh, in toll roads, but also in um, like in in railways, they invest they invest in the infrastructure that gives them a very secure uh, income. Uh, rather than like even in in gas, the the networks for gas are so such secure um, streams of revenue. They don't deal with customers; they only deal with company, the retail companies that deal with with people. Um, so certainly, uh, that's exactly what they do. They're also very strategic in investing in companies that they can where they can increase the debt, or certainly in the companies that we've looked at. So this companies that are described as under leveraged. So um, 
yeah, certainly very strategic in, in where they put the money with their lowest risks and, and the highest potential returns. Um, in terms of, of blended finance as well, it, it, yes, the, the less risk that the private sector is exposed to, the more risk it ends up lying with the governments. Um, and that just, and then inevitably pushes up costs for end users. And let me actually maybe piggyback uh, right on a, a, a question to your group as well, your project as well from Tobias, who's, uh, who says, well, who notes that? Well, the, with the COVID-19 crisis, what we see is this uh, massive fall in uh, private capital flows to financial infrastructure, uh, but at the same time, the limiting the fiscal space, policy space that's available for public in investments. So, you know, the, the idea of de-risking all of that, that, that we see as a part of the pre-COVID discussion, now we're seeing this squeeze. At the same time, you know, there's a rhetoric about build back better. So how's that gonna happen, uh, especially for global South countries? Uh, where do we go from there? So perhaps shall I take this one, Gary? Sure. So, so I think that, um, yes, private finance suffered uh, to a certain extent because of COVID, but I, it's also clear that international agencies like the World Bank is very keen to get that back on track with their building back better agenda. Um, so I think, uh, and, and we're seeing uh, the start of that in terms of how the World Bank considers, um, you know, uh, post-pandemic reconstruction in the light of uh, these increased debts. So if we're looking for alternatives, if that's the question Tobias is putting to us uh, in terms of what would be alternatives rather than looking for the ways in which the, the international financial institutions are going to try to revive their agenda, um, I think a start would be meaningful debt relief uh, to create fiscal space. And the uh, second thing would be perhaps that uh, the international community can take internationally visit financial flows seriously. And what's quite striking is that when we had um, uh, much celebrated uh, financing for development third summit in Addis Ababa in 2015, the outcome document managed to write private public private partnerships into a paragraph, but it wasn't willing to deal with the institution of a global tax body. So I think there are ways in which these things can start to be addressed. And, um, um, but there is no um, willingness uh, in the international community to, to take these particular um, policies forward. We need to enable countries to have uh, better domestic resource mobilization mechanisms uh, so that they can make decisions in terms of how they would mobilize their fiscal space with where they to have it. Uh, currently, they are integrated financially in very lopsided ways, etc. Uh, and that means that their, their menu of options in terms of how they're going to build, continue building. I mean, it's not as if suddenly their infrastructures have been decimated, it's that their infrastructures to a large extent are not existent in terms of power generation, hospitals, whatever. Um, but um, so I think there are alternatives. They are not so complicated. It's just that there is no, it, there doesn't seem to be a, a, a willingness to push forward with this. And what I think we'll see is, and we're starting to see already, and um, actually with colleagues, with Maria Jose Romero from your dad and colleague Urania Dimaco, we have already started exploring initially how the World Bank is responding in terms of how it sees its mandate. And that's, I mean, I know that uh, Yanis, Daniel and Joe again have looked at that in the context of the green agenda in terms of how it wants to make sure that the Wall Street consensus as Daniela has coined it, and we are so grateful to her for this, uh, is going to come out alive and screaming out of this um, uh, pandemic, unfortunately, because of the particular debts that will have been racked up in terms of uh, the, to, the, to deal with what the pandemic yeah. imposed on, on countries. Yeah, you know, you look at the fact that uh, for the much of the global south, it's not build back better, it's build. And um, and yet there, we have to probably think about uh, debt forgiveness to get anywhere near that. Now, actually on regulation, I'm gonna, we're gonna flip this back to perhaps the other group. Uh, your, your emphasis was on regulation, the complexities of that. We have a question from Brian Kim, who's asking, saying, well, you know, let's think about Hyman Minsky's proposal for stabilizing the banking system. And uh, that, you know, that we, you know, he's ticking off several ideas uh, that kind of going beyond 
Glass-Steagall. Uh, you know, for example, restricting assets and liabilities of subsidiaries in a bank holding company uh, mandated that the banks uh, make, you know, not make loans that excessively implicate the central bank with overdraft liquidity and uh, basically also breaking up the big banks. I mean, Minsky had numbers of ideas like this. So, you know, the, and, and of course, this goes to actually as something I, I'd like to kind of see us move toward what this all means for macro policy. And insofar as uh, monetary macro policy now clearly involves uh, prudential regulation, as well as, as uh, you know, monetary policy control, um, you know, the question that's being asked by Brian here is, well, what do we do uh, if, if in the context of the super cycle idea that you've put forward, uh, it embraces the entire global system. So what kind of solutions do we need to start thinking about? How do we get there? And I'll leave that for any of the members of the first research group. Okay, thank you. Maybe I'll take that. Um, to say that, um, I mean, in a sense, the, the obvious, we, we already alluded to, to the solution uh, when Yanis described these uh, um, alternatives of the green super cycle, which can be this uh, private finance led that we see, and incidentally to respond to the question about what kind of international institutions or global spaces we have where we can where we can see a, a, a more reasonable or a more, a more, a more uh, substantive solution to the climate crisis. What we see that most global spaces now are basically dominated by, by global finance. And you can look at COP26 that is happening this year in, in the UK. You can look at uh, the UNDP, the UN. Uh, only UNCTAD has remained a space where one can think about alternatives. And UNCTAD has published a report in 2019 on the Green New Deal which goes some way into thinking about these uh, questions. Uh, I think it's a bit more hesitant on, on dealing with the power, political power of global finance, but, but for us, the, in the discussions that we have about uh, thwarting mechanisms, the idea would be that basically you need to repress market-based finance or the type of uh, the, the evolutionary changes in finance that we had with the rise of shadow banking as a thwarting mechanisms, they need to be rolled back. And you can roll them back very easily if you, if you put a, a very significant uh, regulatory regime in place that basically penalizes dirty finance because a lot of that now comes from the kind of uh, large asset managers and institutional investors that are global in, in nature. Whether yeah. there is a political uh, momentum for this or a political context in which this can happen, no one has to, I, I am very skeptical about it. Uh, I, I think it's a, I'm, I'm not sure what it would take uh, for that to happen, but maybe uh, we are looking at it uh, uh, as interest rates are rising in the United States, maybe everything will change very quickly if uh, bankruptcies or, or systemic well, risk is say, back. Rising interest rates in the States uh, in the context of all this decade of quantitative easing could lead to some very surprising bankruptcies. Uh, but actually, you know, and we would, we would want to move, wouldn't we, from the realm of soft law uh, at the level of BIS and global regulation towards something harder. We've got just a couple of minutes left. And so actually what I'd like to do is to ask uh, perhaps the third members of each of the groups to just reflect a little bit on uh, sort of how would, what are the implications of this for the way that we would, we would want to see macro policy conducted in particular. And uh, if, if, you know, if, if I can uh, ask our anthropologist, uh, Ben, to, you were talking about assemblages. And you know we think of people's voices and so on, and we know that one of the challenges these days has been of uh, people, you know, feeling frustrated that their voices are not represented, and therefore taking often very radical action uh, against democratically elected governments, uh, elected for better or for worse. So you know, what what steps do you see there, Ben, that could that could lead to changes in macro policy? And let me throw that same question to. To Joe and and uh, and Joe, if 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 as you're thinking, you know, we saw Daniela sketch out the vision of you know global uh, changes, but how about national policy changes? How should macro policy change in light of some of the research you've developed about the super cycles? Why don't we start with Ben and then we'll move to Joe? Yeah, thank you, Gary. Um, as a social anthropologist and somebody who doesn't know an awful lot about macro policy, this answer may seem a little naive, so bear with me if that's the if that's the case. But yeah, you um, pointed out that I sort of started my part of the 
uh, the presentation by talking about assemblages, which is this idea, not just from anthropology, but also from science and technology stu studies, Brunel et al, actor network theory and places like that come in, that, the, um, that actually the social is rather complicated. It's not just technologies, it's also people, it's networks, it's, it's community, communities and it's ideas. And that those things don't exactly have an equal power, but they all have a substantial power. And that actually trying to work out how any system fits together involves looking, uh, looking across those different types of power. And I think that sometimes people will, um, both sort of inside and outside of, econom of economics and political economy, think of these things as um, relatively, uh, relatively technocrat uh, technocratic and existing on the level of systems and not, at the, and not at the level of people, and therefore hard to understand. And I think that maybe um, possibly some of the uh, additions that anthropology, but also sociology and some, uh, some other um, interdisciplinary areas can add to, uh, to this is the sense that actually these uh, these are easier for people to get their heads around because they involve they involve power they involve the um for for example they involve political actors they involve uh, they involve communities they involve regulators whose power are limited by things that we can understand networks laws yeah. uh, and relationships yeah. so in terms of people be uh, ending up dissatisfied um, and acting out, I think that possibly actually one of the benefits of interdisciplinary work is making economics more intelligible because it shows the complexity of actors that go into yeah. making up economic systems. I'm not sure if that made any sense, but this is something. No, that it, I would like it to does. Make. And actually, my uh, my partner for much of the project in the research hub that we guided, uh, Laura Baird, uh, records how. When the Bank of England has gone around to local areas, they're often telling their experts are telling people the way it is, uh, what they have to accept, rather than actually soliciting ideas from their experience, as as some of our research uh, done by uh, Jonah Montgomery and her her partners has shown is important. Hmm. Let's turn for the final word. We're right at the at time and a minute over, uh, but Joe, I keep challenging you with uh, limits on your time. But what's your what's your one page memo look like? Uh, if you have a, a list of things that we should think about for beginning to transform macro policy in ways that would be consistent with the super cycle threats that your, your research points out. Thanks, Gary. I think that what I would say is that the COVID crisis has changed perceptions of what is possible for macro policy. Mm -hmm and that it's very clear now that many of the thwarting mechanisms which were central to the last uh, super cycle, such as an inflation targeting framework, um, systems of flexible exchange rates, the assumption that lender of last resort would be a relatively infrequent and um, limited action. These things I think are, are increasingly widely accepted as having disintegrated. I mean, the, the basic building blocks of aggregate demand against aggregate supply determining, in, determining inflation, the Phillips curve, and so on. We do live in a world now of big fiscal deficits, global dollar liquidity provision, uh, outstanding quantitative easing on a, on a very large scale. So I think that it's, it's now widely accepted that things have changed. And the task is really to di make sure that change uh, is directed in a progressive way. I think it's very possible that this kind of shift to a new fiscal activism, uh, monetary activism, ongoing monetization of deficits, ongoing dollar liquidity provision through swaps mm -hmm. could be done in a very kind of paternal, not paternalistic, um, patronage type way from, you know, Tory MPs standing next to roundabouts and getting some new bypass built because they've got Boris Johnson's ear to globally countries forming hierarchies and, and access to uh, international financial support and liquidity and so on being used as a way of sort of keeping you know, the good guys on our side and, and the other people in check and so on. So I think at all these different levels, our task is to, is to say, look, we can see the world has changed. It's inarguable. We're not going back to the way it was, but we have to do this in a, in a progressive way uh, and resist the sort of the divide and rule tendencies that could come with this kind of shift. Yeah, I, I appreciate that. And if I could just uh, draw a line between your, your thoughts and Ben's, you know, Ben talks about the importance of, of citizen voice and, uh, and, and raising that, and that will be crucial for 
offering a counter to the uh, politician who's got the ear of Boris Johnson uh, so that we can even out those odds. If I could also comment just to, as, as I hear you, this policy debate, as you say, the, the context is changing, the institutions and, and, the, and the possibilities are changing. And in both cases, both of these research projects really are not only explorations of what is, but they set up benchmarks for where we could be or where we should be relative to where we are. So I would urge in some sense, both teams of researchers to move to that, those questions of what does this tell us about what changes we need to make um, at both international, national and local levels in order to get closer to an, a sort of system that functions for all and not just for the financialized elites. I think we're at the end of our time. We're actually uh, four minutes over. I'd like to thank everyone for their, uh, their kind participation, especially for our, our researchers for their, their great contributions and their amazing work. And to, can, and, and to urge those listening to please uh, you know, put your, your efforts into the equation as well. We need everybody's mind, everybody's heart moving forward as we try to solve these nearly impossible and yet uh, absolutely essential problems facing us on planet Earth. Thanks everybody and have a great night. Do I, will we have a final word from our SOAS hosts? Are we, are we good to go? Thank you, Gary, for sharing. All right. Thank you. Good night, everybody. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you.